Good morning, everybody. Um, third presentation, so hopefully we're, we're still with it here. Um, name's Tom Brown, Principal of Galena High School. This is my 12th year um, with me. I have Miss Melissa Ballard, Miss Melissa Carson, Miss Rachel Tillotson, three of my world language teachers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tier 1 instruction. Um, and that's where really where we feel the rubber meets the road, if you will. As a building principal over the years, um, I told this to the administrators yesterday, it's kind of dramatic, but you're always looking for the holy grail of instruction. And that, that would be those instructional practices that meets the needs of all kids and helps all students achieve high levels of achievement. And that's very hard to find. I asked the group, I said, how are you doing in your search for the holy grail of instruction? It's very difficult. Not sure it's ever going to be out there to meet that. But the closest I can find, we have some very, very good instructors at our school, a uh, high-performing school. Um, the, the ladies with me here today do an unbelievable job. And they're a model. They're as close as I can find to that of professional practices that meets the needs of a large, large, large group of kids. You're always looking to meet the needs of all of your students. Some of the things that they do that they're going to talk about, um, and I'm going to talk like overarching stuff here, the how and what happens in their classroom. And, and I'm not sure what everybody does here in the room. Yesterday I was talking to principals, so it's kind of like what could we see, what could you expect uh, in your jobs, uh, if you're working with students, what's high-level practices. Um, we see active, engaging class, classes. When I go into these guys' classroom, there's always something going on, bell-to-bell -bell instruction. It's a lot of student-centered, student-focused. Um, these guys acting as facilitators much of the time of the activities that are going on. Um, students have choices often in their classroom. Their student movement, it's not odd to see kids up and moving around in their classrooms and going from area to area, peer-to-peer -peer discussion. Kids actually talking to each other and just instead of sitting and listening to the teacher. Uh, those things are active, uh, engaging things in the classroom. Um, differentiate instruction that happens in their classrooms. Literacy, speaking, and you would, obviously not an odd thing in a language classroom, speaking, reading, writing, listening, but when you go in, it's, and I go into a Spanish 1-2 class, 90% of it's in Spanish, and these are Spanish 1-2 classes, kids just learning the language, it's total immersion. They've rethought, they've, they've reinvented, from my perspective, over 12 years, how we do language instruction. Uh, so when you listen to them, they're truly doing those things. Um, the why, or the, excuse me, the what, the curriculum. They plan out their curriculum very intentionally. These things are all important with tier one instruction that you have to do. Uh, they plan their assessments along with their curriculum. They're very professional. They take their time when they're in their PLCs. They're always working on these things. Um, and the why, and this is where really I've seen, you've seen a change over the years. Um, the why with languages is not just about building a simple sentence, knowing your colors, knowing your numbers from one to ten, some very simple things, and obviously it gets high, more high level than that that I don't know, but the why for them now is can they communicate? And isn't that what learning language is about? Can you go out and actually communicate? And that's what they're trying to do in their classrooms every single day. The kids are learning to communicate with each other. Um, before I let them go, you would think that then they do all those things and they'd have these common classes and everything looks the same. Uh, and I love, what I love about it in what's hard to find the Holy Grail is there's not one way to do this stuff. You go in their classrooms and they're all a little bit different. You see a lot of these instructional practices, but if, there's the out, if you look at their class, come in, have groups of four, we have groups of two. We have one teacher who came to me, Ms. Blard says a couple years ago, Tom, do I have to have desks in my class? Uh, I guess not. I haven't thought about that. I guess, no, we really don't need desks. Um, and she moves them in and out, but, there's, but the activities I said in Tier 1 instruction, then they get all their kids uh, to engage in these activities as they go through. So when you listen to them, know that it's truly what we see on a daily basis, and there are things that meets the needs of all the kids, and if you guys are in the classrooms and have a chance to promote these activities, certainly encourage that um, as it really helps kids achieve high levels. So with that, I will pass the mic off to them, and they will tell you a little bit about what they do. Um, we just want to start by thanking our administration because a lot of our ideas, um, like Shaw Middle School was saying, we've failed, we've learned, but through learning we've created a program that has had many benefits for our students. Um, we're going to talk today about 21st century competency skills and what that looks like in our classrooms. 
Okay, so we really focus on having our students be globally minded. Learning a language traditionally was about memorizing vocabulary or conjugating verbs, and we don't like to approach it that way because we don't want our kids to leave our classrooms being able to just conjugate a verb. We want them to be able to go out and actually use what they are learning. So by doing that, we want our students to make connections with, their, with each other, with the community, um, and with the workforce, and be able to actually go out and use that material once they leave our program in the workforce, in the university system, and elsewhere. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the benefits that we've seen, because as we've tried to make our classrooms uh, more globally minded, we've seen benefits for our students, and there are three main ones that we have seen um, in particular, and one is proficiency. Our students are not just, like they said, conjugating verbs, making simple sentences. They're using it for real world, meaningful tasks, things that they are interested in that are meaningful to them. We've seen them increase their cultural competency. Um, Cross-cultural communication is a, becoming a more and more um, important part of the workplace. And so they're increasing their ability to be able to communicate across cultures. And along with that, their perspectives are getting broader. They're not only knowing that there are other perspectives out there and learning about those perspectives, but they're also able to experience those perspectives and that helps perfect their cross-cultural communication. Okay, so Melissa already mentioned 21st century skills. We try to incorporate these into our classroom on a daily basis. The first really essential skill is collaboration. We do it as a team, but we also like to teach our students to be able to collaborate. We focus on three different modes of communication, specifically interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational. And these look different with each class period, but interpersonal, where students are talking with each other, um, they are talking with members of the community, interpretive, they're reading text, we do a lot of text analysis, and that's not just literature. It's also texting, songs, um, a variety of other different things. Presentational, we'll have an example of that later with the museum walk. Um, we do debates, all sorts of different types of collaborative activities. Um, one of the 21st century competencies we also wanted to um, touch on is knowledge construction. One of the things that we're really grateful to our administration for is they allowed us to bring back the Spanish for Spanish speakers program. Because when you have students who uh, learn English at school, speak English at school, but at home, they hear Spanish, and maybe they even speak Spanish, their needs are very, very different from someone who's learning a second language for the first time. So they allowed us to bring back this program, and we're able to give the students literacy instruction in Spanish and do a lot of interdisciplinary activities. So we collaborate with the English teachers to make sure they're getting the same literacy instruction in both English and Spanish. We do readings from a variety of different areas. We've done readings from science, from art, geography, history, things like that. Um, the kids are analyzing charts, tables, and graphs that are all written, that are, have all the words in Spanish. And we're also able to incorporate SEL concepts. The kids are doing self-assessment and peer editing all in, all in the target language. And we've seen the benefits of the fact that they are not only getting literacy instruction in two languages, but they're also getting those concepts that they're learning in their other classes reinforced by also going over those same ideas in Spanish. It is so important for us to tie what we do in the classroom to the real world so that there is a justification for what they're doing in our classrooms. We start at the very basic level. One thing that we do in my classroom is we have a pen pal program with the TWI program at Mount Rose Elementary School. We've had a lot of success with this program because our high school students lose all inhibition inhibition <laughs> when um, writing a letter to a third grade student. They are free to make mistakes with their vocabulary, their grammar. They just know that the third grader is going to think they're cool no matter what. Um, another thing we do is we have community involvement projects. So our students are not only in the classroom, but they have to go out and actually use what they are learning. So here's a picture of a handful of students and I when we attended a UNR event where they were actually able to interact with a person who came as a guest speaker at UNR event um, who had gone through the immigration process um, and had st struggled with several of those aspects. And coming into the United States, coming in with a family that wasn't maybe considered the ideal family structure. Um, and after 
this lecture, they were able to talk with him and interact with, with him. They also were, had the opportunity to communicate with several of our instructors at UNR. So it gave them another view of what it looks like when they get out of high school, and it motivated them to not only continue to do work within the community and within the immigration process, but to further their education. Um, this next one is a slide where we had some students go and part of their um, project was to volunteer within the community. So they went to a local elementary school and they volunteered with students who are native Spanish speakers and they helped them with many of the other disciplines such as mathematics and history, things like that. And they came back so motivated to continue on in this process. Um, several of my students actually continued to, to volunteer after the project was over because they had such a great, um, a great experience with it and they want to make a difference. I'll talk about this one quickly too. The use of technology. We use tons of technology in our classroom. You're going to see some stuff in a minute, but um, these are just a handful of the apps that we use and the websites that we use. One example, Edpuzzle. Edpuzzle, if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it, it's a website that you can go to. It's free up to a certain number, so we use the free apps because we don't have a lot of funding for the additional things, but you can take videos off of YouTube or Vimeo or TED Talks, and there's a whole list of them, and you can edit the video and you can insert questions. And so I did an activity with my students where they had to go and listen to authentic um, conversations and interviews of people in Equatorial Guinea, which is one of the unknown Spanish-speaking countries. It's in Africa, and it's a fairly new country, and so they have a lot of problems there. They have a lot of social issues, political issues, things like that. So they listened to this interview, answered some questions on Edpuzzle, and then they had to select one of the problems, create a business plan, and present that business plan after doing a lot of research to um, a board that we had created a mock board in our, our classroom. And so they were using what they had learned and then going out and actually creating something that they might actually be able to use later in life in their job. Another thing that we like is um, using QR codes for presentations. I don't know about all of you, but my largest class has 37 students. Trying to get them to do presentational speaking skills is time consuming. So what we do is we have our students do the research. Um, there's a rubric that they follow, but when it comes to the presentation, they put their presentation on their project, attach it to a QR code, and then we have a live museum walk where other students can go around, scan the QR code, interact in real time with the presentation, and then do a self-assessment through the QR code with their rubric. We have now taken a five-day process and turned it into 30 minutes. It's a big time saver. We also love to use the virtual reality videos. As you can see in this video, our students are watching the history of Cuban dance on their telephones, and they are moving 360 degrees, experiencing geography, climate, culture, food, history, it's all mixed in there and they are surrounded by it. It's also funny to watch them move around. <laughs> okay, so another thing that we've been able to do as we've tried to make the program more globally minded is um, we've been able to incorporate some SEL concepts such as self-regulation. When the students can see that they're able to use the language in a real world context, they're much more motivated to set their own goals and try to reach those goals because they see the payoff, they see the benefit at the end. Um, again, with the native speakers class, one thing that we do is at the beginning of the year, they think about what they want to know how to do because there's a little bit of self-consciousness on their part because a lot of them will say, oh, I don't, I don't speak well, or I, they're embarrassed because they say, I can speak this language, but I don't know how well I read it, I don't know how well I write it. And so they write their own learning goals for the year. We go over those together, and then I have them make a poster out of those goals, and we put them all up on the classroom wall. And that's really helpful because it serves um, as motivation for them. Maybe during weeks when they're feeling unmotivated, I can point to the posters and say, no, this is, this is where you're going, this is what you're going to learn how to do, this is what you wanted to learn how to do. Um, and they can also kind of assess themselves and ask themselves whether or not they're meeting those goals that they set at the beginning of the year. Our ultimate goal is for our students to not 
only leave our classrooms proficient in the language, but go out into the community and use the language. We also would like them all to graduate with the seal of biliteracy, which is relatively new, um, as a way of proving to the community, to future employers, and to other colleges and universities, the skills that they have. One of the ways we use or we assess our students is with the national based proficiency test, which is known as the Apple. In over the two years we've been using this, at Galena, we've had over 100 students in just two years either graduate with the seal of literacy or on track to graduate with the seal. We also do a lot of project-based learning. Um, in my higher levels, they learn a lot about politics. We have a political unit. It's very high-level vocabulary. And they learn about other political systems, economic systems, political leaders. And then their final project is they run, they create a campaign. And so they are running for president. So they have to select three platforms in the target language, and they have to research those. One of their one part of the project is creating a oops, a video. Is it on there? Sorry, it's a commercial. It's a campaign commercial. We're going to see if we have it in just a minute. But um, they create a campaign commercial that's 30 seconds to a minute and a half long. Um, that shows what their campaign is, and then later we have debates among candidates, and they select the candidate of their choice. So we'll see if we can, I don't know if we have that. No? Okay, sorry, we don't have the video today. We had it yesterday, but it got removed for whatever reason. So we'll move on. That was the last slide to our presentation. <laughs> oh, wait. One second. Um, we should mention, though, that the great thing about world languages is it's a cyclical process, and the majority of our students have started the process in seventh grade at the middle school level. So by the time they come to us, they have a great foundation, and we get to really work with them at the upper level doing authentic learning practices like the commercial. These are our fourth year Spanish students, and their ability to interact with the language is just mind blowing. All right, as they wrap up, and maybe we get the video up because it's, well, here we go. Necesitamos un presidente que va a combatir contra el analfabetismo. Necesitamos un presidente que va a combatir contra el narcotráfico. Necesitamos un presidente que va a luchar para el medio ambiente. Me encantan los animales. Y los animales. Hola, me llamo Tanner Amundsen y me postulo para la presidencia porque me necesitan. Voy a detener el analfabetismo y narcotráfico y pelear para el medio ambiente. Incluso mis competidores me gustan. Esto es mi vicepresidente Mackenzie Sullivan y vamos a ganar esta elección porque nos necesitan. Me llamo Tanner Amundsen y apruebo este mensaje. All right, um, just to wrap up the, the talk about tier one instruction then from again the, the administrative level and you guys when you go back to your buildings and whatever capacity you have, um, you know, have a, we talk about having, it starts with high expectations for all your kids. That's one of the things that as a school you can do and, and it starts there. Uh, another thing that I think is key to getting tier one instruction throughout is having um, your decisions based off of your highest performers. You know, that's where you set the bar at your school, is how high can you set that bar? And you communicate, you ask what their needs are, what do we need to do, how can we make this a better place? Be those people in your buildings. Uh, and then, and I can't obviously, I'm, I'm only an administrator in one building, but one of the final things is remove barriers, you know, and you can encourage your administrator to do those things. You can encourage them to uh, say yes to conferences and sending the professional development and, and getting those skills and getting out there. But you, of course, have to, Negotiate that with whoever you're working with at your site, uh, but I think that's a really important part of that is with your high performers and getting that, building that culture, uh, that capacity at your level. Um, and know this when you hear these guys, you, the kids in these classes, they enjoy it. 
and it's really about the kids. When you go into these classes and you've heard about the numbers that were successful and we have as far as high levels of student achievement, you heard in standardized measures of assessments being the Apple test or AP test, we're getting there, but the kids enjoy it and we're building our language program. Uh, we've increased our allocations, we're increasing our numbers because kids enjoy this type of instruction. So you can have high levels of achievement and students enjoy it at the same time and now you're building a really good place for kids and the adults in your building. So thank you guys for uh, listening to our little presentation here today. So we I think have some yeah, questions, Ola? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you to our Galena Grizzlies. So any questions for the team on the stage? Hi, so um, I'm in my last year at UNR for education and my emphasis is ELAT. So um, the question I have may, please don't laugh because I'm not fully in the classroom yet. I just up here and there. Um, so in regards to having the target language and you're using literacy and the student is um, say writing a piece in their target language. I know a lot of students can converse say in Spanish but not necessarily can write so well because they may not read or write in their target language. How do you guys go about that then? So are you actually helping them to be more proficient in reading and writing in their target language and then you take that piece and ask them to write it in English as well or? No, the, the key there is making sure that the, the assignment mm -hmm. is level appropriate. You don't want to give them something too easy but you also don't want to give them something too hard. Um, we always encourage our students to work with the knowledge and the vocabulary that they have because it's tricky. They want to translate from English into Spanish and they don't have the same skills. Yeah. So making sure that they're not pushing themselves too far ahead where they don't have that ability yet. Okay. The only reason why I ask is because I'm actually um, bilingual, but my mother was from the Dominican Republic and she was actually illiterate in her language. So she spoke Spanish, but she didn't read or write it. So actually, I just you know, wanted to see how you would. Well, and then that's a really good piece is that this is where the native speakers program comes in and is so valuable because we do have so many students in the district that struggle with that same issue. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we can help them become literate in their native language and at the same time tie it into the the target language of English, and they mirror each other. So our students are becoming more successful and more literate in all their other classes, mm -hmm. especially one of the things at our school is all the teachers use the same literacy practices. So what works in the science class, we're using the same terminology and the same practice in the English class and the math class, and that really helps our students in the ELL programs or even just our, they aren't proficient in their first language. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have one more, and uh, here we go. You're probably the wrong group to ask, but I figure you must know a little bit about it. Could you speak to the seal of biliteracy and explain that to us? We're not the wrong group to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, the seal of biliteracy is um, fairly new. The state just adopted it last year. It is a seal, that, a literal sticker that goes on the diploma that says that the state of Nevada recognizes a student as being both proficient in English and one other language. In order to earn the seal, they have to have a culminating GPA of seven semesters in English of a 2.0 or higher. They also have to pass either the Apple test or the AP language test. And then there's some provisions if there's not a language like a Dutch, we don't have that in Apple, so they can do the OPI test. Um, and then there's the IB, but there's not that many languages with IB either. Um, once they pass those two things, there's a few other requirements, and then they've earned the seal. And actually, UNR is getting to a point where they will start accepting the seal of biliteracy for college credit. So it's a, right? <laughs> It's a big deal, it really is. And so our ultimate goal, and the students don't even have to be in a language because we do have so many students in our city, in our county that speak other languages. And so we're honoring that. I just wanted to add to that. They, when they take the test, they have to score that level in each of the four components. So reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So our students are not only speaking in the classroom, but they are doing lots of literacy skills, lots of authentic listening, which is where a lot of the technology comes in. 
but they have to score that level on each of those. It doesn't balance out. So if they do score highly on one and low on another, they don't pass. They have to score high on e in every single one of those proficiencies. All right, well, let's thank our Galena Grizzlies and our team for another fantastic Ed Talk.